Coming up on this edition of the Black Vault Radio, Doctor of Chemical Engineering Chris Cogswell steps into the vault. He tackles the hardcore science behind metamaterials and the claims of Bob Lazar. Will these popular topics in ufology stand up to scientific scrutiny? Dr. Cogswell weighs in. There are some really interesting parts of this idea that I think taken in a vacuum, we should we should think about seriously. It seems like their knowledge of material science is from the 70s. You know, and those are the tests that they're gonna be running. One of those would suggest that they've got anti-gravity technology. The other one would suggest that they've got nothing. When Bob Lazar predicted element 115, um, that's actually a really easy prediction to make. His idea of it being used as a fuel is in theory because of its radioactive properties. However, that's not ne- that's not really what he's always said about it. All that and much more. So stay tuned. The Black Vault Radio is about to begin. More than 20 years ago, I began a journey. My quest for the truth. My name is John Greenwald and I have hammered the United States government with Freedom of Information Act requests trying to get answers. I have more than two million pages of declassified documents for you to download at theblackvault.com. Now, I attempt to dive even deeper and talk to some of the most brilliant minds on this planet. No government secret is off limits and no question is off the table. All I aim for is the truth. This is the Black Vault Radio. That's right, everybody. This is the Black Vault Radio. I am your host, John Greenwald Jr., As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast and radio show of choice. I know that there are tons of options out there, so thank you for either sticking with me or tuning in for the first time. If it is your first time, welcome. If it's your second, third, fifth, or even 35th, welcome back. Really appreciate that support. We've got a pretty exciting show coming up. I've got Dr. Chris Cogswell coming up. Now, Dr. Chris is a chemical engineer. His PhD is in chemical engineering, and his expertise really gets into nanomaterials, metamaterials, different types of compositions, and so on. And I thought it would be fun to bring someone on with his background uh, for one main reason, and that is there seems to be an influx of these scientific buzzwords when it comes to the UFO phenomenon. And one thing that I've learned here in the last year and a half plus is that not only myself, and I'll put me at the top of the list, uh, that I just don't understand some of it, it seems like the mainstream media that's reporting on it doesn't really understand it either. And then, of course, that trickles down into the UFO community, and they say, well, if it's a metamaterial, it has to be alien. Well, that's not true. And quite a few months ago, I had uh, just just kind of sought some documents on metamaterials and realized there were so many that I couldn't add them all to the site. It would take a year. But on top of that, it, it really showed that this was research that was going back quite some time. So I focused in on a niche that I thought was actually pretty cool, which was metamaterials and their connection to invisibility cloaking. And yes, those are all official U.S. government documents, not leaks or, you know, rumors or anything like that. So I created an archive. I'll link it all in the show notes page because I know I'm going to bring it up with Dr. Chris uh, later in the show. You can hit the show notes page at www.theblackvault.com slash show notes. That will forward you to the notes for each and every episode that I've ever posted, including links to where you can stream it. So make sure that you bookmark that because it is an important page for you to make sure that you remember for each episode. Uh, I call it the roadmap 
for the episode. So everything that I talk about, Dr. Chris talks about, so on and so forth, it will be on that page. One quick thing to deal with here before I bring uh, uh, Dr. Chris Cogswell on is a new document that dropped onto the Black Vault this week. It's a little bit of a somber note, especially if you've been listening to this program. You know that uh, do- I almost called him Doctor. He hated that. Uh, Mr. Stanton Friedman uh, passed away, uh, sadly. And I mean, I've, I've already talked a bit about all of this, so I'm not going to go into it again. Uh, but what I did was I went after FBI files related to Stanton because obviously with his background, I was very curious to see what the FBI would have. Now, let me first say foremost, more than anything else, when I do stuff like that, I'm not looking for anything criminal. And the fact that he does have a file, which, by the way, he does, uh, does not mean that he did anything criminal. As most of you know, I have a huge archive of FBI files on all sorts of people, celebrities, UFO people, um, scientists, journalists, authors, politicians, world leaders. I mean, all sorts of people. And a lot of them, they, they just don't have anything criminal in them, meaning if you have an FBI file, you did something wrong. I want to stress that because I think that there's often a misconception on if somebody has an FBI file. If you are interested in viewing it, I would highly recommend you do it simply because it shows that Stanton was an amazing researcher, and I will point out why. But on top of that, I think he obviously had a security clearance. We all know that. Uh, But that really created some special attention his way when he started filing Freedom of Information Act requests. Now, for those who want to follow along, if you do go to that show notes page, you can uh, click on the link for the Stanton Friedman FBI file. I created a special page just for it. Uh, It has proven very, very popular this week in the sense that uh, there are tons of people downloading it. If you load that PDF, I want to point out two different pages to you. There are 64 pages total in the PDF. That obviously includes the letter and then my uh, standard image that appears at the top. But I want to point out two different pages. And this is kind of a fun example. Well, not fun. But this is an interesting example on how to dissect an FBI file. I want to start at page 9. So go ahead and scroll to page 9. Now, you'll notice as you scroll through, there's a lot of information that's blacked out, and you'll see secret stamps on the majority of the pages. Now, we do know that uh, Stanton Friedman had a secret clearance. Now, it is unclear what on these pages truly makes it the classification of secret. Now, we can kind of ask that question without a definitive simply because we have no idea what's underneath all of those redactions. Now, I say blacked out, but you'll notice that they use a white out method. And they do that simply because they don't, uh, they don't want it to be as jarring looking when you hold these up, let's say, in front of a television camera. Ironically, Stanton Friedman is the best example of that. The National Security Agency, when they release some of their UFO files, Stan would often hold them up when he would do radio interviews and write, or excuse me, television interviews, and rightfully so because they were so striking to look at. Now, I'm not saying that he played a key role in them kind of switching it up a little bit and using white, uh, but I will use him as an example that that's really, in my opinion, uh, what they're trying to get away from is the striking look of it. So when you have a white box instead of a black box, it doesn't look as cool when you hold it up as a visual. That being said, though, page number nine, look at paragraph, oh, I don't know, because there's all these different lines. It's in the middle of the page. And the last, well, I'll read you the last part of this paragraph. He, meaning Stanton Friedman, also requested material dealing with a proposed study of flying saucers. At the time, Friedman made this request He provided specific file numbers of FBI HQ files in which this information was contained. It is not known 
how Friedman obtained these file numbers. Now, I'm only reading that portion of it. You can read the rest of the file. But in essence, they're talking about a Freedom of Information Act request that, that Stanton sent in. And oddly, he had information he shouldn't have had. That's how I read this anyway. He had details on files that seemingly had never been released before, yet Stanton knew the exact FBI file numbers. And I think that that, that to me, is kind of what sparked the majority of this file. How would he have that information? He had a clearance. Who was he talking to? Who, who, you know, how was he getting all of this? And I think that that's what piqued the FBI's interest, in my opinion. That is one of the biggest keys to his FBI file. A lot of the rest of it, and again, I, I recommend you read it, it has a lot of his background information that the file says that Stanton submitted. I don't know the answer to this part, uh, but back around this time frame when he had submitted uh, the request, I don't know at what point those with security clearances that are utilizing the Freedom of Information Act uh, should be offering in their background information. And that's what Stanton had provided to the FBI. So that's what a lot of the file is, are mailing addresses, physical addresses, Stanton's employment history, quite a few other details that he had submitted. But obviously, he did that for a reason, and I'm not sure. I can't deduce. Maybe I just missed it. Can't deduce if that was requested by the FBI or if Stanton just offered that up. I don't know. But obviously, internally, on this secret document now declassified, it shows that Stanton Friedman had knowledge of FBI file numbers that obviously they were feeling maybe he shouldn't have, or uh, possibly they're just curious where he got them. So I think that that's what sparked a little bit of what you're looking at in regards to this file. Obviously, that redacted information is going to be a heck of a lot more telling if that ever gets released, so maybe we can fill in some of the holes, but we, we just kind of have to guess a little bit here. The next page, uh, scroll down to page 56. And, and page 56, as I can't even get there, there we go. So page 56 is a, another secret document, again, declassified. There are key redactions in this, and that's something that I want to point out. I'm going to read you uh, pretty much the top paragraph. This memorandum classified uh, secret in its entirety. Federal Bureau of Investigation Memorandum dated May 20, 1985, advised that confidential sources who have provided reliable information in the past advised that Stanton Friedman of, and then they list his addresses, and then there's a bunch of information blacked out, and then there's a parenthetical with the letter S right next to it. Now, what that means is, is that information is classified secret. Now, what exactly did these two confidential sources supply the FBI about Stanton Friedman? This, to me, is the most interesting page out of all of this. Because if this was in regards to Freedom of Information Act requests or his letters or so on, these two confidential sources would not be supplying from the outside of the FBI secret information inside. Does that make sense? So what I mean by that is if this was about his Freedom of Information Act request, they would primarily keep it internal and they would not start reaching out to outside people. So the way that I read this is for whatever reason, these two confidential sources went to the FBI, not the other way around, and they provided information about Stan. What that is, was, or could be, I have zero idea. I don't think it's criminal, though. Just, uh, again, I want to punch that uh, because I'm not trying to allude to the fact that he was up to no good. You can deduce that by the fact that the files really don't, really don't indicate that there was any quote-unquote investigation into Stanton uh, when it comes to a criminal or law-breaking or he messed up with his security clearance or whatever. Zero indication of that. But what was the secret information? 
So check out those files. It's very, very interesting to see what the FBI has on anyone, let alone Mr. Stanton Friedman. So he will uh, largely be missed, uh, obviously, and I wish he was still around for so many different reasons, but one of which is just to figure out what this might be. I do know because he had talked about it in the past that he received either part of this file before or the majority of what we're looking at or exactly what we're looking at. I'm not sure. I wish I could ask him. But what I don't think he's ever mentioned, at least to my knowledge, but please write me and correct me if I am wrong, is Stanton going into what this could potentially mean. He always talked about the negative name check. And what that meant was when you're doing clearances and stuff, they do background information and they check to make sure that, let's say, Stanton didn't have a criminal file, that he could hold that with uh, from his employer. And if they don't do those background checks, they could be issuing security clearances to people that shouldn't have them. Now, obviously, Stanton is not an example of that. He got his security clearance and it was very long standing as indicated in these files. Uh, but that being said, that's why they do these name checks. And so I know he had made reference to that, but not about confidential sources and stuff like that. So if anybody has any information, please feel free to write in and let me know. I'll give you credit if you could uh, help solve that mystery because I'm not aware of any of those details. Okay. So that's one of the cool files that I wanted to profile before we get going with Dr. Chris Cogswell. He's coming up right after this short break. Don't go anywhere. On this episode's TBV Dialogue segment, I welcome Dr. Chris Cogswell to the show. Chris has a PhD in chemical engineering, and part of his research study focuses in on the creation of engineered nanomaterials for energy applications. He also serves as the host of the Mad Scientist podcast, a show which focuses on the science, history, and philosophy of popular science claims. Let me welcome to the show, Chris Cogswell. Chris, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I'm super excited to be on. Well, I'm super excited to have you. I've wanted to do a show about science. I love science and have for a long, long time. But I'm going to be honest with you. I'm kind of an idiot when it comes to some of the more advanced claims. So, uh, I, you know, I admire your uh, background and your knowledge on this. And I know you and I are going to be chatting about quite a few different topics uh, through the next hour or so. But thanks again for joining me. Let me just start a little bit about your kind of background as a scientist and see exactly what got you into it. I always like to kind of get some background information from uh, first time guests. So let me know how you got into it. Yeah. So the way that I really got involved with science, um, you know, when I was a kid, I really loved reading about the history of science and all the scientists that I sort of looked up to, you know? So, I mean, I I read a lot of books about uh, Nikola Tesla and Einstein and, you know, all, all these different, all these different folks, um, and particularly when I was in high school, fell in love with the books of Michio Kaku and Brian Greene. And so uh, just from that, I sort of felt like, you know, when I went to college, I really wanted to study physics, I thought. And then actually in, in my high school chemistry course, uh, a teacher that I had for uh, advanced placement chemistry, she invited a group of students to a nanotechnology day that was held at Columbia University where, you know, high school students could go and see people working on nanotech projects and just kind of get a sense of what it would actually be like to be a scientist working in that field. And so I went to that event and absolutely fell in love. I uh, got to see uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, give a talk, which is pretty great. Got to see some, um, some people that weren't much older than me doing work on nanomedicine and the creation of nanomaterials and even sort of, you know, I mean, nanorobotics isn't really a field just yet. However, kind of the beginning stages are occurring right now in labs across the country. So even getting to talk a little bit about that to some people and, you know, self-assembly of molecules, which was especially interesting to me and actually ended up being what I worked in. And so that was kind of what sealed it for me, you know, and going around the room and asking people, well, what field are you working in or what degree did you get? They all said chemical engineering. And so it wasn't really anything that I had 
I had thought of doing beforehand. Like I said, I really wanted to do theoretical physics um, is what I thought I wanted to work in. And then uh, got to university and uh, started out as a chemical engineer, took my first philosophy course and fell back in love with that and the philosophy of science. And so I ended up, ended up double majoring in philosophy and chemical engineering. And then uh, when it was time to decide, did I want to go to grad school or did I want to go out into the workforce? You know, uh, again, no one really, at the level of kind of the stuff that I wanted to work on or the sort of things that I found interesting, which was, like I said, this self-assembly of molecules and nanomaterials, there really isn't a lot of applied science yet in that field. I mean, there are some companies that do research work and, and do actually make materials that do that stuff. However, it's really cutting edge kind of stuff that needs to be done in, a, in an academic lab. So I decided grad school was the best case uh, or the best option for me. And so was lucky enough to join the team at Northeastern University in Boston, which is where I got my PhD. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's history, right? And so then I graduated, got a job and uh, started the podcast to talk about the history and philosophy of science. And in particular, trying to teach the public a little bit of science by discussing uh, popular science topics. Obviously, one very popular topic nowadays is the UFO phenomena, and I bring that up simply because I know that you have a bit of an interest in that. When did that uh, that that interest come around for you? Yeah, so you know, uh, I like to give this. You know, in my in my initial discussion of kind of my background, I said, you know, oh, I was reading books on these scientists and things. Those science books were in between books, you know, about the the pyramids being UFOs and you know Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and <laughs> all that kind of stuff, right? So, I was always a kid who loved the the weird and strange side of science, and UFOs is a big part of that mythos. So. When I was a kid, I just ate up those books, ate up those topics, and absolutely fell in love with the, uh, you know, I mean, I, the way I like to say it is, I am not sold that there is necessarily anything to any of these stories. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, I think that there's, anytime you get a huge portion of the population, though, and, you know, not a huge portion, but still a sizable portion of the population, you know, thousands of cases come in a year, um, Anytime that there is something like that occurring, there is something interesting to study there or something interesting to look at. And again, whether or not that is, well, there are actually, you know, uh, aliens and spaceships visiting this earth, or there is a interesting sociological phenomena occurring where people create these sort of, you know, memes that spread throughout their own uh, small communities. Either way, there's something really interesting to study there and something really interesting to talk about and learn about. And so, uh, you know, that's always kind of been the area that I love. And so when I was, when I was doing philosophy uh, work and, you know, really taking these courses and, and doing kind of independent research, um, you know, as much independent research as a someone double majoring in, in two crazy things can, can do. But, you know, when I was doing independent research towards the end of my time at school, the question that I kept coming back to and the stuff that I really found interesting was why is it that people believe, why is it that some scientific ideas have a really easy time getting through to the public while others don't? And conversely, why is it that some pseudoscientific or unscientific beliefs have a really easy time getting to the public and others don't? So the example I always give is um, in the United, you know, after the industrial revolution, one of the big shifts was the shift away from uh, natural, or I guess natural is the wrong word, but wood burning, uh, you know, burning wood for energy, for heat and energy. There was a big shift from burning wood to burning coal. And so that shift occurred much more quickly in Europe where they actually ran out of trees. You know, there, there weren't trees to, to, to log anymore. Whereas the United States, we lagged behind Europe you know, almost 70 years in the adoption of the coal, uh, coal burning oven as a primary mode of energy. That is a really interesting story. And part of that is the economics. Part of it is the anthropology. Part of it is how society viewed these energies. And part of it also is the way that those industries, you know, fought against the public consensus on, well, coal is more efficient and, you know, whatever. So, that is a story that repeats a lot, and it's very interesting, especially in the modern age, 
why is it that some scientific ideas don't get out there, don't spread as easily? And then never, some of them never find acceptance, which is you know fascinating. Why do you think that that is, though? It, it's all kinds of reasons. You know, I mean, I think a big I think, honestly, a big part of the problem today in the modern world is that science has been really bad at talking to the public. Even in even in cases where, you know, there is very clear cut evidence for something. It's really hard for a scientist or the scientific community to distill down in very simple terms the arguments that make their point. Mm hmm. Right. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Right. So the 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 greenhouse gas effect has been known about since about the 1860s, 1870s. In fact, the idea of a of a the, the idea of the atmosphere trapping some heat inside of it while releasing others is one of the fun. It's, it's one of the foundational studies upon which all of our understanding of heat transfer and thermodynamics is based. Um, the the scientist Foyer, who has a you know Foyer's law is named after him, which Foyer's law for those listening who aren't uh, engineers, Foyer's law is a way of measuring or mathematically predicting how much heat will transfer through a solid surface, um, or not necessarily just a solid surface, but you know whatever between two surfaces in contact. Mm -hmm. uh, Foyer's law, Foyer did studies where he was looking at. Well, why is it that some planets appear to be covered in ice or appear to have very, very hot uh, atmospheres, whereas the Earth doesn't? And so what he found or what he suggested was that it was because of the molecules or, or rather the atmosphere itself. And it wasn't until like, you know, the 1950s, 1960s that we actually proved that in the way that um, certain gases absorb infrared light. But still, this is an idea that's been out there in the sciences for a very, very long time. And it wasn't it wasn't disbelieved or it wasn't mistrusted until about the 1980s, 1990s, when oil and gas companies started pouring money into uh, essentially propaganda. So it's, it's partly that science is bad about discussing its results, but it's also partly that, you know, frankly, money in advertising really works. And so it's really, you know, it's really easy to skew the public's opinion when you are able to buy ad space mm -hmm. and, textbook publishers and all that kind of stuff. I'm surprised to hear you say, I mean, obviously you got a couple parts of that answer, but but you had let off with science isn't good necessarily talking to the public or scientists aren't good uh, talking to the public. Is the public listening though? I mean, I'm a vi I, I'm a big advocate for 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 understanding real science and things that we can prove. And for me, especially in the last couple of years, and then again, just to kind of zero in on, let's say, UFOs, people are more acceptance of ideas that go completely contradictory to what we know in science. So do you think the people play a role at all? I, I, yeah, absolutely. The people absolutely do play a role. However, I think that in general, what we can say is that it is a lot. You know what? I, I grew up, I had a very... I was very lucky in my upbringing to have people around me and my family who were interested in the sciences or who were inclined towards, you know, let's say academia, right? I had uncles that had all gone to college. My mom went to college. You know, my dad is a totally different story, but still I had family members who were, um, you know, who, who had access to that kind of level of education. Mm -hmm. That's not true of everyone, right? Obviously. Yeah. And so, when, when you are talking to a kid who, you know, no one in his family has gone to college, you know, maybe she has never met anyone who's a scientist, actually. She doesn't know any scientists. Or, you know, they just don't – these kids may not ever have interaction with real science. But on the other hand, what they do have interaction with are, you know, the History Channel. Um, and so, you know, shows like Ancient Aliens or – um, the mermaid documentary or uh, <laughs> finding Bigfoot or whatever, if that is their only interaction with scientists, quote unquote, then that, that really makes a hard, that makes it really hard to get them listening to other scientists because it sets up a dichotomy, right? And part of it is cultural too. There is this, especially in the United States, there is this idea that edu the more educated you are, the more liberal you will be necessarily, and that's not necessarily the case, right? However, 
it has created a it has created a distinction almost where certain parts of the country are essentially both parts of the country aren't really talking to each other mm-hmm. and part of that distinction amongst you know who is not talking to other people is people who are more tending towards, let's say, um, spiritualism or religiousness, religious experience generally, are not necessarily talking to or trusting people who on the other side are more tr- more prone towards rationalism or more of a materialist worldview, which happens to include most scientists. So there is a real challenge, I think, where we're just not, we're not approaching each other on common ground. And that's partly why I got involved in you know, groups like say MUFON um, or why we, the show I think is, you know, so uh, I, why I hope that the show will be successful in this is because we are approaching people on the ground that they find interesting mm-hmm. and we are not talking down to them. You know, when someone comes to me and says, I had a scary experience at night and I don't know what it was. I don't, you know, I don't tell them that they're just some, you know, slack jawed yokel who was, you know, drunk or something, right? I listen to them. Mm-hmm. I, I take their opinion seriously. And then, you know, um, th- in that way, you respect that there's someone else on the other side of this story who's really giving information. Um, and also, though, you, you are more effective when you tell them, you know, hey, I don't think you should go to hypnotism. It's damaging. You know, go, why don't you go check out. Um, you know, some, some other ways of alleviating your, your anxiety about this, or, you know, even when you point out that someone, cause there are real people scamming people in these fields, yeah. you point out scammers or, or people that are making a bad faith effort here. Um, that's a lot easier to stomach for someone when it's not coming from a place of, I think authority is the wrong word, but it's sort of, you know, mightier than thou, holier than thou ivory tower, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on this video, but I want to throw this out to you. This week I saw, um, he calls himself a debunker. I hate that name, but Mick West, are you familiar with Mick West's uh, work? I am. I am. I am. uh, I am familiar with Mick West. I actually, um, I like most of Mick's work. Yes. Yeah. And and truth be told, although he and I got into a public Twitter uh, battle a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I I, I think it remained friendly. But anyway, I'm a huge, um, you know, kind of I have huge respect for what he does. I don't necessarily always agree. He's very thorough. Anyway, this week he dropped a video about the gimbal and the aura, the glowing aura around it. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not a FLIR expert. I've used them in television shows that I've produced a few times, but I've, I don't know what I'm you know, talking about technology-wise. And so Mick drops this video about the gimbal and, and shows other comparison videos of auras around like a kid and a dog and other jets and this and that. And he he very smartly says, is this alien technology or kind of what the going... Uh, the going explanation is, or is this just something explainable? And he determines that it's a simple filter uh, on the video and on the, on the FLIR technology and so on. The reason why I bring this up is I want to ask you as a scientist, does it frustrate you that those sources that we are getting our information from, obviously you brought up some silly ones like finding Bigfoot and so on, but let's just talk about the New York times. Let's talk about some of these news channels, the ones that, that we should be able to trust a little bit more than like a, finding Bigfoot show on reality TV, whatever network we're watching. Does it frustrate you as a scientist that people are not doing more work? Let's say like Mick. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's extremely frustrating. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's funny. It puts you in a funny position as a, as a scientist or as, you know, I, I, Here's the thing, right? We try really hard on our show, and I try hard to do this anytime I speak anywhere on these subjects to say, you know, the part of the part of science that I am an expert in or the part of the world of science that I am more qualified to talk about, let's say, than, you know, your average um, college graduate is really small. You know, it's <laughs> it's chemical engineering generally, sure, but you know, when you when you get down to the nitty gritty, it's like a you know a group of material types that do a very specific thing that uh, you know most of them have never made it out of the lab yet, and you know so it's people get this I think opinion when you say well Doctor Cogswell or you say you know I'm a scientist I have a PhD whatever 
they assume that you are going to be better at every aspect of science than the average person. And that's mm -hmm. not true. You know, it's just kind of the lab coat, uh, the lab coat fallacy, right? It's like the apply, you know, the application to authority. So when these, that's one thing I always look for in these stories is when they're pointing to people like say ex-military members or, you know, quote unquote spies or whatever. And that is, that is used as a way to try to hold up their evidence as being more valid than anyone else's. You know, the way I like to think of it is if the gimbal or the Tic Tac video came out and was just brought to us by just some person, you know what I mean? A, uh, I don't know, someone with really good, uh, I don't know, just someone with a camera, right? Someone with a FLIR camera mm -hmm. or a very, very strong, uh, you know, whatever, telescope or something. If those videos were brought up just by them and didn't have this chain of command, I think, or there's rather this chain of, of uh, kind of evidence, I think people would be a lot more skeptical of them generally. And that's been very frustrating, I would say. The other thing that's been really frustrating too, like you mentioned, is no, people have not been very careful or very smart about looking at the sourcing of all of this information. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's all coming from, uh, you know, approximately the same group of people who all are going to make a lot of money on their TV show. If these things turn out to be really interesting and, and real, you know? <laughs> and so it's not, there has not been a lot of impartiality here. And that is one of those things, again, that's very frustrating. And so it just feels like, you know, this, um, it's a trap that these communities fall into constantly, which is there is controlled uh, release of information. There is kind of a media blitz by a certain team or group of people. And then it turns out, oh, it's linked to a new TV show. Yeah. And then everyone watches the TV show and then nothing ever comes from the evidence, you know? And, and so that to me has been kind of very apparent from the beginning and, you know, to be honest, the part that really frustrated me personally um, was the, you know, suddenly the talk of material science things came up again. And that's that area of science where I am, you know, that's that small part of science that I'm qualified to talk about, really. <laughs> and so when when those things come up, it um, it just makes my jaw hurt from clenching. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, and and let's go there. I was going to kind of switch gears to uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the science of Bob Lazar, but let's hold on to that for a couple of minutes. And let me ask you about this talk about metamaterials, because I think that that's what you're talking about, the frustration. Obviously, this ties back to the original reporting of materials uh, by The New York Times, I should say, the reporting by The New York Times about materials that were obtained through this quote unquote UFO program and so on and so forth. And it seems like now, fast forward to uh, here we are in June of 2019, after that broke in December of 2017, metamaterials has become like this code word. I'm not saying that this is true, but I'm saying for many, it seems like metamaterials is this code word for, oh, it's got to be alien then. You know, this, oh, this ties into UFOs. And so I started seeking just through documents I already had and then filed some FOIA requests and went through databases. I mean, there is just a massive amount of, of pardon the pun, material on metamaterials that I couldn't even post it all to my site to show everybody, look, this is not like something new. This has been around for a long time, but I'm not, I'm not somebody who's versed in science. So let me ask you, is there anything to this talk and this aura about metamaterials being tied to UFOs or is this commonplace? So here, here's the thing, right? I think that there are some really interesting, there are some really interesting parts of this idea that I think taken in a vacuum, we should, we should think about seriously. Although I don't know if this case or these purported materials should be taken seriously. So what I, what I mean by that is if, if we were to, the way that we are currently looking at using metamaterials or looking at using these materials with multifunctional properties in our applications on Earth, we are looking at shielding radiation. We are looking at shielding like, like cloaking technology. So, you know, um, the ability to cloak our ships or our planes or whatever from, um, you know, signals being able to be bounced off of them for tracking or other information gathering. 
We are looking at uh, materials that have surface properties that are not found in nature that would make them, say, uh, you know, more aerodynamic or they be able to shear away from different fluids. So, you know, moving from, say, space into air so that your the amount of friction and the amount of uh, damage from heat is minimized. And we're also talking about materials that potentially have the ability to, let's say, you know, take in uh, photons from the sun and convert them into usable energy on a ship. All of those would be considered, you know, a metamaterial is really a catch-all phrase for any material that has been engineered to have properties that are not, um, not found in nature. You know, and in the scientific literature, the idea of metamaterials has specifically meant optical properties. So the first metamaterials really were uh, were structures that were able to uh, filter light by chirality, and so chirality is a really interesting um, a really interesting property. But essentially, um, what it allows it to do is well, essentially, what these materials allow you to do is it allows you to determine if one is chiral or not and filter them out that way. Chirality is a is an interesting chemical topic that is way too uh, nitty gritty for us to get into here. But the basic idea has always been that these materials, because of their structure, because of their chemical makeup, and because of the way that they're, they're actually built, um, will have interesting properties that we cannot get in nature in specific regards to electromagnetic uh, fields. These specific materials that they are talking about in the UFO world right now could be metamaterials. We, we don't know. They have not been tested adequately. However, um, the reason that I am doubtful is because of their lack of testing, number one. Number two, because the plan to test them is extremely lacking in um, rigor. You know, it's sort of, I don't know, it's like a, um, it's, it's almost similar to the way that a, a, a kid would try to think about searching for interesting properties or something, right? You know, I don't mean kid to be kind of... Um, offensive or anything. What I mean is, you know, imagine that you are, imagine you're a medical doctor. And so you're, you know, someone in your family gets sick. You would have different and more specific ways and more complex ways of looking for illness, the cause of the illness, the symptoms, everything else, than say someone just coming out, you know, from the field, right? Someone with no medical knowledge at all. Mm -hmm. well, that's true of material science as well. There are topics, kind of hot topics that were interesting in material science back in, say, the 60s and 70s, that those are the types of searches and those are the types of tests that are being talked about by these researchers. And that gives me pause, right? <laughs> that it seems like their knowledge of material science is from the 70s, you know, and those are the tests that they're going to be running. They're not running new tests. They're not running the kind of testing that someone really involved in the creation and study of, of these nano-engineered materials or metamaterials would be doing. You know, they've run isotope tests. Those isotope, te isotope tests have continuously shown them to be within the normal range for Earth materials. So there's, it, the tests they have run have shown nothing of interest. So it just, it just get, gets worse and worse for these materials. When you're saying that they are running tests, who are you referring to? So as far as we know, there are some, you know, there are those, uh, those YouTube videos and things that go around on the materials that Linda Moulton Howe had studied, supposedly, that, um, you know, the, the, the materials that To The Stars Academy have supposedly collected and are mm -hmm. running tests on, you know, when they released their first uh, video discussing how they were planning on running these tests, they mentioned two things. They mentioned electron microscopy, and they mentioned isotope ratio testing. Isotope ratio testing will will literally the only thing it can tell you is whether or not the material is from is made from from components that are similar to components we would find on Earth, or if they are similar to components that we would find in space. That in my mind is not enough. You know, it could be an asteroid, it could be a piece of a meteor, it could be it could be anything, right? It could just be a rock that fell um, that's not within the normal average range for isotopes in their area. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of things that that material could be. And that would not tell us anything interesting about the material being engineered for a purpose, right? So that is one big, big uh, problem there. The other big problem is with the electron microscopy. Electron microscopy can only look at materials, say, maybe up to a resolution, maybe of, say, 200 nanometers. 
And even that is extremely, extremely, uh, extremely high resolution. You know, what, what we're really talking about here, what they should be looking at is not just a picture of the material itself because all kinds of materials look interesting under a microscope, right? Aluminum, uh, naturally, naturally occurring alumina, um, has interesting patterns to its surface that might make a layman think, oh, it's engineered in some way, right? But it's not. It's just that nature is lazy and likes patterns. So there are, has to be more specific testing done. And I detailed what I thought some of that testing should be in an article that was published on, um, on a Open Minds uh, website, mm-hmm. uh, but essentially discussing, you know, they need crystallography. They need... Um, elemental analysis, more detailed than what they're doing currently. They need to have some idea of the testing parameters that they would like to look at, right? If they think that these things are, and, and all uh, the rumor is, that these are materials which take in a certain wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum and then convert that for some reason into gravity waves or something, if that is the case, then that would be very easy to test. Um or at least one would expect it to be easy to test. And if, you know, again, in my mind, the proof is in the pudding, right? Are they creating rocket ships or are they running a documentary series on the History Channel? Well, one of those would suggest that they've got anti-gravity technology. The other one would suggest that they've got nothing. Yeah, and I'm sadly leaning towards the latter. Uh, but I yeah. want to. But I want to be fair. It, you said that some of the tests were easy. One one hiccup that I ran into uh, uh, production wise, I was doing some shows for History Channel. Ironically, it's a small world. One of those pieces that's in their slides that they're showing that they have. Um, I had uh, profiled it uh, probably ten plus years ago on a History Channel show. We did as many tests as we could afford, but literally it was a cost issue. So to be fair to them, are the tests that you're proposing, despite them being easy, are they cheap? Um, well, it appears that, so that is a good question. They would not necessarily, it, it depends, right? And what I mean by it depends is if they are serious about the studies that they are doing and the science that they're doing, one would think that they could find academic collaborators. Sure. And even if they can't find academic collaborators, one would think since with their connection to uh, Bigelow Aerospace that they would be able to find government collaborators, right? So if the cost, if the prohibitive, you know, if what is keeping them from running these tests is the cost, let's say, of running one of these tests, well, that that to me doesn't necessarily hold a lot of water Mm -hmm. because most of the tests that I would think that they would need to run are relatively cheap, right? So I would think that they could run um, simple powder X-ray diffraction, right? That is a test that there is an XRD powder XRD machine, um, at least one, at every single university I have ever visited, and I would imagine every major research university in the world has an XRD machine. It is a fundamental piece of equipment. Um, transmission electron microscopy, or TEM, um, would be another piece of fundamental uh, research that they could do that would get them better resolution than SEM that would tell them a little bit more, but not very much more. Um, Porosity measurements are, again, cheap and easy. I think one of those machines is probably runs on the order of thousands of dollars, and they would have it forever to test other materials. Um, All of those tests that are the characterization of the material itself would be easy to run, would be cheap to run, and would probably take them all of a week to do if they were just able to camp out at the university library of any uh, mid-level research institution in the United States. I, I, we're about a year after they announced their Atom Research Project. Now, that's to the Stars Academy for those listening who aren't aware of that. Uh, that's mostly what uh, Chris is referring to here and what we're chatting about are the pieces that they have collected, they meaning uh, to the Stars Academy. They launched on July 26, 2018, uh, what they called the Atom Research Project. And that, from the best of my understanding anyway, I'm sure I'll get letters because I have it wrong, but best of my understanding is that this particular uh, subset of their uh, To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science group is going to be studying these pieces. So here we are about a year later. We really, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, don't know anything other than some slides that have been put on some presentations, but they tease it, uh, some videos that have been blurred, um, 
Is this surprising, concerning to you, exciting to you? <laughs> I mean, what, do you, what like this is the and the reason why I'm bringing this up because people know I'm critical of of, of um, some of these claims, and I'm not trying to pick on them, but this is obviously the talk of the town right now. It's the talk of television right now. Uh, what do you think about this? Is this are we on the right track? It it reminds me a lot of when. Um, Okay. What was her name? Ketchum, um, Doctor Ketchum. I think I think she was a doctor. Anyways, the Bigfoot researcher said that she had Bigfoot DNA, and she had you know she had run all the tests and she had some amazing stuff to find. And then uh, it went by years and years that she didn't have anything. Melba Ketchum is her name. Uh, just just came to me. Um, you know, she said, "I have this scientific evidence. It's going to be proof. It's going to be great." And then finally, when she did release it, along with some pictures, supposedly. Um, she published it in a journal that she herself had written, or rather, a journal that she herself had created, and it turned out to be nothing, right? There was no evidence there at all, and there were some wacky pictures that looked like a Chewbacca mask. <laughs> um, I, I, I am. When when the To the Stars story first came out, I was super excited. I was still at MUFON right before that whole scandal erupted. Um, I was like, oh my god. This is going to be so cool. I can't wait to see who they have on their science team. I cannot wait to see who's involved in all of this. And then the pieces started coming out of who was involved and, you know, what they were trying to do and the kind of, you know, getting info on the test that they were thinking of running and just kind of asking continuously, like, well, do they have anyone who has an academic affiliation with the university? Do they have anybody who has access to a lab that can actually run these tests? You know, is there any interest in having someone with those credentials be on board? All of those questions were kind of rebuffed. And, you know, the longer it goes where it's the same, um, the same group of people who have yeah. been kind of at the center of a lot of the big busts in ufology over the last, you know, 40 years, the more and more that that happens, the less and less excited I get, you know? And so I, I personally, I mean, I'm always happy to be pleasantly surprised, but uh, from what I can tell currently, this is mostly a means of, um, of selling, you know, add space on their TV show. Yeah. And that's unfortunate. It really brings the newsworthiness of what they potentially have out of it. And they put it and look, I'm, I'm speaking as a, someone who's worked for A&E networks before. I have nothing but respect for them and I'm not trying to talk trash, but I think that they would agree too. They're not trying to be a breaking news channel. So something like this, if it were to come out, probably shouldn't be on History Channel at first. Uh, we should see what we saw in December of 2017. But you bring up an extra, uh, an excellent point, and that is a lot of these same names that have appeared over and over for the last 30, 40 years are kind of still involved in this. That brings me to uh, building off of that point that the same stories are now coming around involved with those same people for the last 30 or 40 years. We've now got the resurgence of the Bob Lazar story, which is 30 years old. Uh, <laughs> we've got the resurgence of the uh, Santilli film, which uh, has largely been believed to have been debunked and, and so on. And it's like these things are completely recycled and these leak documents, which, you know, you guessed it, are connected to people that are tied uh, in some way to, to the Stars Academy. And the biggest supporters, not to go off on a rant, but the biggest supporters are those that weren't around in ufology 30 years ago. So this is all new to them, and they don't know the amount of research that, uh, you know, people like my, my friend, the late uh, Stanton Friedman, did on Bob Lazar. And they don't right. know a lot of that stuff. So, again, not to rant, but you brought up an excellent point that we just kind of keep seeing the same names and the same stories recycled over and over. Now, um, I can talk to you all day, and I know I'm a little limited on time, and I want to get in some of the science behind Lazar and uh, getting away from the pieces of the Atom Project and what they're saying. A lot of people, because again, it's the buzz of the town, thanks to Joe Rogan recently for reviving the Lazar story and putting it into the forefront. What are your thoughts about Bob Lazar, and should it be in the forefront right now? Uh, so the Lazar story is one that is, it is of particular, um, it is of particular uh, frustration for me 
because of how just completely Stanton Friedman pulled it apart. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's really, it's one of those things like the, although I guess with that resurgence, I should not be surprised about the, you know, the autopsy video coming back out there too. Another thing that was just thoroughly, thoroughly debunked. It's, and again, you know, debunking that we, I'm going to go on a mini rant here Please. really quick. And I just did. What I think Please. about the Lazar stuff. <laughs> it's a okay. lot of fun. You go. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there is a, there's a view in this community you know, we, so the UFO community is cyclical and it's cyclical in a way that a lot of uh, non-scientific or pseudoscientific beliefs are, which is unfortunate because I think that there is a lot of really cool evidence here and a lot of interesting stuff. You know, I was just saying this this weekend. There are things that we have learned about UFOs and UFO stories and UFO uh, contactees and whatever. Again, you know, outside of the ultimate evidence of, well, we have a body or something, there are things that we have learned that could very easily uh, remove some of these extra, you know, extraneous ideas and pieces that are floating around out there that would help at least focus some people's study and maybe help us get some better books out there on the subject. You know, if, if to say nothing of documentaries and things. Mm -hmm. The, the Lazar story is one that is perfect for this kind of cyclical, you know, recycling. Because like you said, it's, it has a pretty long shelf life. It hasn't really ever gone away, despite it being debunked. It helped to refuel and it helped to create this whole mythology around, um, you know, Area 51. And, all, you know, we had ideas of Area 51 beforehand and stuff. And again, you know, wh whatever you think of the government potentially having um, a secret space program or you know whatever these things are that are out there these ideas lazar is really central to a lot of that and so a lot of the ideas that came out from his stories um never really went away we just kind of ignored the fact that they started with this lazar guy because he had been debunked and then now today we brought them back and said hey this is great look how cool this stuff is again and you know he's saying stuff that is that was proven five years ago or stuff that was talked about 10 years ago without ever looking to say, hey, wait a second, he's the reason that stuff was talked about 10 years ago. You know, it's like, um, you know, I don't know, we're, we're going to start a rumor right now in this show that, you know, um, Chris Cogswell is the strongest man in North America. <laughs> and, you know, in 20 years when I come out and say, well, I was the strongest man in North America at one time, maybe someone will look at this show and say, ah, oh, there was evidence. Look, someone was talking about this 20 years ago. Yeah. Right. I've seeded my own story and created my own, um, you know, my own proof, essentially. Right. Oh, all right. So the, the ultimate point of that tangent was there would be a lot of good that could happen on these ideas and in these fields and things. People, if they wanted to take them seriously, could if only they would throw away the old stories. Once something is dead, it should stay dead. You know, sometimes dead is better. To, to steal a phrase yeah. from a uh, from pet cemetery, but anyways, but that's I think that that's the, the not to interrupt you that that's an interesting way to look at it. But the problem is is that they can't stay dead. It, it's not dead to a lot of people, and to see the comments, like just out of morbid curiosity, I read through some of the comments, like on Joe Rogan. Now I want to be fair to that audience. They're not. They haven't been around. They may not even have an interest in UFOs. But I just yeah. don't think that that this is given an opportunity to really be truly dissected. I interviewed Jeremy Corbell. He's a friend of the show. I'm not trying to badmouth him uh, at all. I pushed him on some of the, the kind of red flags of, of Lazar's story, and he kind of pushed back. And uh, you, when you watch the documentary, those red flags are largely unaddressed. And why I yeah. bring that up is you need to address the education thing. You need to address his claims. Um, why I wanted to, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on is, um, and you talked about it a few minutes ago, is some of his scientific claims, let's say on element 115. And this is a, a probably and arguably top reason why people say, well, Lazar's got to be telling the truth because they had not, uh, they had not, um, uh, discovered element 115 when he started telling his story. And now we know it's real. So it has to be legit. He has to be telling the truth. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, well, uh, t talk to me about that. Is, is there any logical reason to believe in that? So the way the beauty of chemistry, it's the beauty of nature, really, is that nature builds up from these fundamental building blocks, repetitive 
and easily predictable results. Sometimes, right? The more simple a system gets, the more easily predictive uh, we can get, right? And that's that's sort of true up to say the quantum scale, and then our predictions go to you know go to crud again. But you know, when we're talking about atoms and uh, protons and things, that's it's still a pretty good approximation. Things essentially work like uh, billiard balls that are magnetic. Now, the periodic table, when when we describe an element. We call it, uh, we describe an element by the number of protons it has in its nucleus. And so a nucleus is where all the positive charges of the atom sit. It's got some neutrons around the uh, protons that are inside the nucleus, and the neutrons essentially act like a kind of glue. Um, they have no charge. And then all of that positive charge from the protons, and each proton has one positive charge, are uh, equaled out by an electron that floats around the proton, uh, nucleus center. And uh, those electrons each have a negative one charge. So if you have a proton, one proton, and then one electron, you have a, uh, you have a hydrogen atom. Okay. Now, and you can think about the orbits of these electrons. It's sort of like a planet um, around a sun, but it's more chaotic than that. They sit in these areas of probability called orbitals, but Anyways, that's the general idea, right? So you got this positive nucleus and then the electron cloud that centers around or, or floats around that nucleus. Every single time you add a proton to a nucleus, you get a new atom or a new element, right? So if we look in the periodic table, these things are ordered by the number of protons that are in the nucleus. So when you have something with, say, uh, you know, um, so hydrogen is one proton, helium is two new, uh, two protons, right? And so we can add protons on and the atom gets bigger, but its identity is still determined by the number of protons. What this allows us to do then is as a chemist, you can predict any element you want with any number of protons and it will probably, um, well, probably is a little bit of a stretch, but it will, it, 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 it could theoretically exist in nature. Okay. Okay. So, for instance, we can say right now that you know, element uh, three hundred and five is Cogswellium, <laughs> and it will have three hundred and five protons. It'll have three hundred and five electrons, and it'll probably have about an even number of neutrons to protons. So, about three hundred and five, maybe a little bit more. Okay. It'll be unstable. It'll probably be highly radioactive. Um, it'll be very large. It will. Uh, Likely, if it's 305, it'll probably be some kind of odd transition metal-like material. Um, and that's that, right? But based on the periodic table and based on our knowledge of chemistry, we can make all kinds of very complicated predictions about this element that will probably be correct. So for listeners at home, right, to do kind of a thought, or not really a thought experiment, right? If you look up a periodic table, you'll notice that they're listed out um, by... Uh, what are known as the periods, right? So, you know, you have something that sits underneath, say, carbon. Something that sits underneath carbon on the periodic table, like, say, silicone, germanium, or tin, we expect will have similar properties to carbon because it is in the same uh, row, um, or rather the same column of the periodic table, if that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. So when Bob Lazar predicted element 115, um, that's actually a really easy prediction to make. First off, you know that element 115 should exist because of the simple nature of the periodic table, right? You know that an element with 115 protons exists somewhere out there in nature. You know it does, right? We may not have discovered it in a lab yet, but you know that it will exist because that is not a hard prediction at all. It's, it's similar to you saying that you predict that next Tuesday will exist. Mm -hmm. And then when next Tuesday comes around, you say, aha, I was correct, <laughs> Well, of course, next Tuesday will occur. It's periodic, right? It, it happens regularly. Um, that's the same thing with these elements. I mean, you know, if I, was, if I was Bob Lazar and I was making claims about element 115, I would have made way more, crazy, uh, way more crazy predictions just based on my knowledge of chemistry, right? Element 115 is in the same column as nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, and uh, antimony, and bismuth, right? 
So bismuth is one of the uh, heaviest elements that naturally occurs on the surface of the earth and is non-radioactive. It's right before polonium on the periodic table and right after lead. So I would predict that Moscovium will probably be, or 115, element 115, sorry, will be extremely dense. It will potentially have some kind of phosphorescent properties. So um, if it existed in nature, it might glow when certain wavelengths of light hit it. I would expect that it will be relatively neutral in terms of its chemistry. However, it will probably have a very active, um, an active bonding. Uh, it'll probably actively bond to things just like nitrogen does, just like uh, arsenic or phosphorus does, right? So you can get very advanced in your predictions and not need to know very much more than a high school chemistry student does so it's, about the periodic table. So it's not far fetched that he that he made this up now. No, that, that, is, that is like I said, it is a certain prediction, right? I gotcha. It is like saying next Tuesday will exist. Of course it will. And so let's take it to the next level of his science, which was, this is used as a fuel. So there is no, you know, his idea of it being used as a fuel is in theory because of its radioactive properties. However, that's not, no, that's not really what he's always said about it. He's mentioned that there were there was a way to you would hit it with some kind of electromagnetic radiation, and it would then generate uh, gravity waves, which could then be used to further fuel the ship in some weird way. There's just no reason to think that that's true. We've generated Moscovium now in a lab. Um, it is unlikely that it would naturally occur as well, which is another one of his big claims because of how radioactive it is and how unstable it is. Now, there is an idea out there in the sciences right now that we will find what's known as an island of stability, which is an area on the periodic table where super heavy elements will be stable. But what we mean by stable there is on the order of minutes, not, you know, years or anything. Okay. So, you know, it's the, it's the difference between, say, Moscovium-115, which is the actual element of 115. Moscovium-115 has a half-life of something like... I mean, milliseconds. It's, it's you know, there, I think right here, the most stable one we found is Moscovium 290, which is a half-life of 650 milliseconds. And so what a half-life means is how long before half of the mass of that element you have will decay to something else. So it takes about, you know, in a minute, all of it would be gone, right? It would be completely other things. It would have decayed over to um, other elements, when so we're talking about minutes, then that's that's long, but it's not very long, right? Yep. It's you know you got a kilogram of stuff, and in a half hour, it's all completely gone. Now, to the layman, though, that means that ultimately its use, meaning what what you're calling Moscovium, I know that that's the real name of what they discovered as 115, but sure. but uh, is is the, the the likelihood then of something with such a short half life used as a fuel? Then we can debunk that. Is that just not possible? Yeah, so it is It is not at all stable enough to power anything, right? Again, imagine you had a battery that would die in, in less than a second, right? That would be useless to you. Yeah, no, I got gotcha. <laughs> that is That is what we're talking about here. Um, there is no way that it could be used really, uh, you know, I mean, even the idea that it could be bonded to something. There's we, we have no evidence that bonding of radioactive elements to other elements make them more stable. So there's no real way to think about that as being an interesting, you know, use of this either or an interesting idea. There just is very little. Again, it's it's a thing on top of all of the other stuff that we that you mentioned in in passing. His his educational credentials, right? There is no evidence that he went to anywhere but a a small community college in California. Yeah. Not that there's any anything wrong with going to community college, you know. Um, I know a lot of people who have you know, even have PhDs or postdocs who started out at community colleges, right? There, there's, that is totally fine. What is not fine is then lying to say that you went to MIT and Caltech yeah. without anyone remembering you, without any memory of your, uh, of your university itself, without any, you know, any evidence that you went there. I mean, a, a graduate level course tends to be between today with overcrowding tends to be between 20 and 30 people large yeah back in the day when he would have been going to courses that would have put it at maybe 10 people maximum even at these big universities so 
how is it possible that not a single person remembers him? Yeah. That is very unlikely. I remember all of my graduate student, you know, uh, you know, cohort. I remember everyone that I, that I took classes with. Yeah, I think people largely forget the the simple fact checking that Stan Friedman had mastered, and and I really did look up to his research ability. And when you look at his article, and, and I'll link it in the show notes page. I know I'm running out of time with you, Chris, but I'll link it into the show notes page uh, to show uh, the listeners to how much research that Stan went into. I want to ask you one more thing on on Element 115, simply because it is such a common, and I think it was in Jeremy's uh, documentary as well, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, but but a lot of people are talking about it that even though muscovium has such a short um you know a half life there is talk that uh well that that doesn't matter because you can make a quote unquote stable element 115 and that that obviously calls back to lazar's claim of taking part of element 115 and now uh that the documentary has been out for a while i told jeremy i wouldn't bring it up on my interview with him because the show had not been out yet uh but obviously in that documentary they were raided uh meaning uh, uh bob lazar's place of work was raided by the fbi and other government agencies and the kind of claim loosely made was they were talking about element 115 so they raided the place looking for it 30 years after he stole it um, it, let me go back to that that question. Is there a quote unquote stable 115 that you could potentially uh, discover in the future, or does that not make scientific sense? So, okay, so two things, right? The first thing I will say, and again, I know I know that uh, you know I I have spoken to Jeremy only a couple times. Seems like a super nice guy. As far as I can tell, the reason that they raided uh, they raided Bob Lazar's home was because he continues to sell dangerous chemicals to people. Um, on the internet, right? <laughs> Including things that are poisonous and um, radioactive potentially and yeah. explosive. So, you know, don't do that. Don't sell those things. <laughs> That's just my first thing, right? Just as a blanket statement to listeners, if you got that stuff, get rid of it, right? <laughs> get rid of the stuff. Um, the island of, so there is this idea out there and it's been in the nuclear physics community for some time of what is known as an island of stability. Moscovium is technically within, uh, so Moscovium 291 would potentially be within this stable area. But again, we are talking about stability of, you know, uh, of approximately a day, right? Let's say, and, and even that is extremely, extremely unlikely. So I'll give you an example here. So these are the half-lives of the Moscovium isotopes we currently know. And so the number here on the isotopes is how many neutrons are within um, are within its nucleus. So 287 has a half life of 37 milliseconds. 288 has a half life of 164. 289 has a 330, and then 290 is 650, and all of that is in milliseconds. So 291, we would expect to maybe have a minute or so of uh, of half life. Let's say. Does that make sense to you? It, it does, but those are different. Those would be, and correct me, please. Uh, those would be totally different elements, and and Lazar was sticking with quote unquote one fifteen, right? So you're no, 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 no. So th so those are isotopes of oh, Moscovium. Okay. All right, and I yeah. So an isotope is I just told a you different I was an idiot. <laughs> it's all, dude. No, it's all good. This is this is why it's so important again that scientists talk to people, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know this stuff would be impossible to know otherwise. Moscovium. Is has the uh, 115 protons. Right? Gotcha. Okay. However, the number of neutrons determine the isotope that it is. Gotcha. So these are different numbers of neutrons of Moscovium. Now, here's the thing. The reason that things decay, the reason that things go undergo nuclear decay is not very well understood even today. There's this I there there is these concepts called what are known as magic numbers, which are essentially kind of the, a, a simple example of a simple explanation. It's not, not hundred percent accurate, but a simple explanation would be, it is the ratio of neutrons to protons inside of an, an element, right? Or inside of an atom. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in carbon, let's say, right? So carbon normally would have, um, carbon would normally have 12. Um, what's the word? Carbon would normally have a mass number of 12, Okay, which is six, uh, six protons and six neutrons. However, carbon, let's say 15, carbon 14, those are, those are radioactive. They decay. They undergo radioactive decay. 
And the reason that, that that appears to be the case is because the ratio of protons to neutrons is not equal. It's out of whack. And so because of that, the nucleus itself is unstable. It's unhappy in the arrangement that it's in. And so it'll start to try to shed either neutrons or protons to get back to a close to one ratio. That makes sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Cool, okay. So um, what that means then is that for, say, Moscovium, which is, um, what's the word? Now, Moscovium, which has 115 um, 115 protons, that would need to have a uh, total of 230 um, nucleons or you know protons and neutrons, parts of the nucleus, to be close to that stability level of one, wow. right? However, there are other ratios that are also apparently stable. And we don't really understand why, but it appears to have something to do with the arrangement of protons and neutrons next to each other in a nucleus itself. So... The short answer to your question, which is a very complicated question ultimately, is there could be a stable Moscovium isotope. However, it would not be it would not be stable enough to keep in a coffee can in your garage or something. It sounds like you wouldn't even be able to get out of his office. No, it is very unlikely that you would be able to get it out of um, out of anywhere for study gotcha. right to, to keep a solid chunk of it someplace it's extremely unlikely and even if you did get a solid chunk of it out there it would be it would still be comically radioactive you know you know we're saying this island of stability does not mean that these elements just exist indefinitely and are not radioactive right um they're still super radioactive they're still super dangerous they're just not they're just not going to disappear on you in milliseconds they might disappear in a minute or so Wow. And last question for you, and I know I'm out of time. Is there anything away from the credentials issues that we talked about and quite a few other things? And like I said, I will link all of you that are listening in to Stanton's article, who he really did a lot of the legwork um, away from the science, even though he did later uh, talk a lot about the science. Uh, aside from all of that, is there anything from his claims about the science that you go, wow, maybe there's truth to this? You know, the... I have been one thing that my time spent doing any kind of, you know, outreach or discussions with the UFO field and even just following the, the current field itself. The one thing that I have been completely fascinated by is just how easy it appears to be to get into very high level government positions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it seems crazy to me, you know, just how un, you know, un, uh, I don't know, uncareful, I guess, uh, lenient, how kind of slipshod it seems some of these clearance processes are. Yeah. And also how simple it is to, or, or how difficult it is once you claim to have been part of a secret program with the government or something, how unwilling, you know, the government in some way, the government's unwillingness to come out and say that, hey, this person didn't work here or they worked here in this capacity or whatever, their unwillingness to make those claims in some ways helps, um, you know, in some ways helps people to make false claims and keep them going forever. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting thing. You know, the, the, the joke I always tell to people is it's like, you know, um, it's like that kid in high school or that kid in middle school, I guess I should say, who would always tell you that, you know, well, my girlfriend goes to another school, right? <laughs> or, you know, oh, she, she's a model, but she's a model in, you know, Argentina or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the government not coming out and saying that that's ridiculous is a little, a little bit like that kid's mom just not saying anything when you're like, does it really have a girlfriend? You know her her quiet her her quiet disapproval can be taken as both acceptance or as you know this is ridiculous. Yeah. Anyways, whatever. Mini tangent. <clears throat> no, um, I, it's it's a it's a good one. I, I think the biggest piece of evidence that works against him that I think most people don't want to realize is the fact that he's out talking about it. You can safely assume that something like he is claiming would be at the highest levels 
of classification and secrecy within the U.S. government. And for him to just, you know, have a store where he sells nuclear stuff and radioactive things. And granted, some of them are actually pretty cool. But that aside, for him to just, you know, walk around freely doing this, uh, people ignore the fact that he would not be able to do it if he was telling the truth. You well, know, that's, that uh, that's to what me, I don't get. That, that to me is the biggest red flag, actually, is is the... Um it, if you were even if you were a whistleblower for something like this, if you were telling the truth on this, another country's government would have picked you up, right? He'd be yeah. living the high life in North Korea. He'd That's be an excellent he'd be, point. You know, it's it's um, if again for me always the proof is in the pudding, right? If you have a alien ship supposedly in a facility someplace, then you would think at the very least that one of these companies that would desperately love to have that kind of technology would have already created a, a, a monopoly on space travel, yeah. right? Would have already created a, a method of shipping things without needing to use fuel. It, there's all kinds of ways that this would change our understanding of the world. Um, you know, but it's, it just never happens. And that's, there's a reason for that, you know, and I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's because it's just not real to go back to your original question. I know I, I keep kind of falling off the wayside here. Is there anything that makes me think, well, maybe there is something to this. I think Lazar probably did work at a facility for the government. You know what I mean? He was a contractor probably, mm -hmm. but I don't think that that necessarily, I think his, I think that Lazar's occupation as a contractor should do more to discredit the notion that being a contractor for the government is an important or special job than it does for bolster the idea that he had alien technology. You know, it's the same thing as, you know, these arguments that, oh, well, you know, you have, um, you have these teams that were working on these projects back in the sixties about, you know, uh, remote viewing and psi experiments and whatever, you know, to me, that just shows that the government doesn't know what it's doing most of the time. You know, when the government is as easily tricked as everyone else is, uh, the, the final thing I guess I'll say, or the final point on this is again, the science, uh, the science doesn't add up, but neither do the idea of these credentials themselves. No major scientific discovery has it. So if something had been discovered like this, where it was reverse engineered from an alien ship or, you know, whatever given to us or something, there would be no record of the development of those technologies in the literature. Mm -hmm. Unless you're thinking or you're claiming that the entire scientific community is part of some big conspiracy, in which case I would love to know where my check is from the government. <laughs> um, unless you're making that claim, it's very hard to, to think that these things that have been out there in the, in the literature for such a long time, um, to think that those ideas haven't been out there or that they, they must have come from back engineering or something, when we've had people discussing these topics for decades before they became a uh, real technology, you know, that to me is preposterous. And so even the Moscovium 115 or the Element 115 thing, Element 115 was being discussed in the open scientific literature for years before Bob Lazar made his claim. So it's not, you know, he did not, even if you want to take it at face value that, well, element 115 wasn't discovered or wasn't talked about until Laz, you know, Lazar brought it up or something, even that claim is patently untrue because there are papers from the 40s and 50s talking about the potential for an element 115 in an island of stability. Wow. So, you know, those ideas are out there and it's a problem of people not knowing or not being able to read the scientific literature um, that makes this an issue for them, you know, that, that, that gives them this sort of, uh, these sort of problematic ideas out there. Well, there's no room for history and common sense in ufology, Chris. We just need to, <laughs> we need to, we need to, we need to do some more TV shows. You can check Chris's podcast out at www.themadscientistpodcast.com. Uh, Chris, I, I know that you've been very gracious uh, with your time and I kind of blew over a little bit on our time limit. So I really do appreciate uh, you coming aboard and helping, especially me, as you can tell by my questions, I'm not, <laughs> not uh, fully up and up on all of the, uh, the, you know, the scientific lingo terms and uh, phraseologies. So I appreciate you taking the time with me and my listeners just to understand a little bit about the science of ufology. So thank you for that. 
Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me on anytime. I appreciate that. We'll definitely have you back. And thank you all for listening. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off. We'll see you next time.